Hi, my name is David Pollard. I am the Director of Workplace Pride, and I am pleased to welcome you to our sixth webinar in our Connecting Members series of webinars. Today we have a very exciting uh, session of the title of Female Leadership in the Times of Crisis, which I think is very fitting for what we're all going through right now. This webinar is hosted by Women at Workplace Pride, which is one of our three programs. We have Young at Workplace Pride and Tech at Workplace Pride alongside Women at Workplace Pride. So this is a great way for us to expose the various activities of work of Workplace Pride to our various members. So now I'd like to, I see that they're already online, I'd like to uh, introduce Marion Mulder. Marion is one of the co-founders of Workplace Pride many years ago, and she is still a board member. So I'd like to hand over the floor to Marion. Hello, everyone. Um, oftentimes I would say hi, guys, and that is exactly one of the reasons why we're talking about the L uh, today. Um, because hi guys uh, might just be a general hello, but it's also uh, has a gender implication to it. So today's topic is about L, the L of leadership, but also the L of lesbian, and it's hosted by Women at Workplace Pride. So um, Women at Workplace Pride or women within um, the Workplace Pride community have been around ever since the beginning, but I, uh, I actually often get the question, so Marion, where are the women? Um, and that's one of the reasons why we've actually made it into a program. and. I would like to talk you through uh, a little bit about Women at Workplace Pride, what we stand for before we go talk to one of our great um, role models today. So uh, with Women at Workplace Pride, we really want to focus on uh, vi visibility of women and lesbian women in general. So for me, um, the word lesbian um, should not be a swear word. It's something um, I'd like to own uh, and be visible. I identify as lesbian. I don't think I've said that so many times in one webinar in, in three seconds <laughs> before. Um, but it's important. So, uh, but there are also uh, women uh, and people in the gender spectrum who identify differently. Um, so when we talk about women at Workplace Pride, we are uh, fully inclusive. So it is uh, organized by women, for the women, um, and everyone who loves those women. Realist so, so in basic, um, uh, basically we have three key things we focus on. Leadership, uh, role model and visibility, and building a strong community. And I think today uh, all, we will be touching on all three, and that's something we do throughout uh, everything we do. Um, and some examples of what we are doing or have been doing over the past it's organized events. Um, sometimes it's large events uh, for 100 plus women. Um, sometimes it's smaller events uh, like meetups. And also we're focusing on making sure that women are actively visible at uh, our general workplace pride events. And um, at one of those events, like last year's uh, um, workplace pride conference, Margot was speaking and was really, really impressed. So I'm really honored that I get to speak to Margot uh, in a minute. Um, and maybe I should just um, int start introducing uh, Margot since we're talking about you. <laughs> and like I said, I was really, really impressed last year um, um, because I didn't know you that much. You're, you're, I'm from the Netherlands and Ireland isn't far away, but at the same time, uh, I didn't know your track record uh, until someone read out your re resume at the conference. Um, but I want you to uh, first introduce yourself before I um, start honoring you with all these awards that I know you have uh, won and all the great things you've been doing. But I think it's nice to give you um, uh, some con some opportunity to first introduce yourself the way you would like to introduce yourself. So, Thank you so much for your warm introduction and, and thank you, David, and everybody. And uh, it's great to be here today. Um, I suppose just maybe a short introduction to myself. So Margot Slattery and um, as Marion so kindly said, I live in Ireland um, and uh, I think I'm, I'm feeling lucky at the moment to live in Ireland because it's probably a good place to be. Um, I am sporting a COVID haircut or a not so good hair and, uh, and challenged with my clothes because I'm in a, I'm in a house that we have in the northwest of Ireland and, uh, I came here two months ago for the weekend and I haven't left since. So, oh, wow. um, it's, uh, it's interesting. And today I have our Ida Hobbit, uh, webinar directly after this. So we have to wear purple. So I had to find something purple to wear. So, um, giving some context setting. So my day job is I work for an organization called Sodexo, 
which I hope many of you have heard of. And we are one of the biggest facility management companies in the world. And I'm very proud to last September have taken the role as our global uh, chief diversity officer, which is something I, I'm, I'm very honored to, to do. And I suppose I was just getting into role and really kind of my finding my way into that and, you know, getting out and traveling the world. And then this happened. So it's been a little stymized. But as I'm saying at the moment to all my teams, inclusion never stops. And uh, maybe a small bit about my own personal background. Um, and by the way, I've been with Sodexo nearly 30 years. Um, it's, in, it's incredible to, to imagine that time. But uh, I've done about 20 different jobs in that time, and mostly in operations. So this is my first time in something, I suppose, more at centre and in the HR side of things. Um, personally, uh, like you, Marion, I would describe my orientation as lesbian. Um, I've been out from my early 20s. And probably the challenge to that was that, you know, I grew up in a very conservative society and uh, it was very hard to be out. I was probably, I was probably more active in life a long time before that, but finding my path was, was a, was a, was a challenging one. And really, I think the thing that changed my life was becoming very involved in the fight for marriage equality, for civil partnership and marriage equality in Ireland. Uh, culminating in 2015 in Ireland, granting and and allowing for for marriage equality for everyone from our community, and uh, that's been an amazing time. I was a chair of an organisation called Glen, which were one of the two organisations that fought for that, and uh, it was a very interesting time. And we're just on the cusp of the fifth anniversary, and I'm looking back at photographs and everything, and going, "Oh my God!" And I'm remembering this time five years ago. We didn't know if we'd make it or not and going out to vote and how that felt. So if anything, it serves to remind me of my how important it is to be active and to be involved. And uh, I live with my wife, Sarah. We don't have any kids. And at the moment, we're living in the west of Ireland and both working from home um, in two different rooms in the house. And uh, listen, feeling privileged and lucky to, to be in this situation. So hopefully that gives you a bit of context. Thanks, Marion. That, that, that absolutely gives some context, but there's also a long list of uh, um, awards you actually won. So I, I don't think you've done yourself justice there. Cause I'm just going to read some of them out that I've oh. heard. So <laughs> um, as I understand that you've actually been really, really out, not just, you know, the, the way you described here um, and amazing what you've done for marriage equality. You know, that, that's that's wow. Um, but you're also on the Outstanding Financial Times 100 uh, LGBT Business Leader. So um, you, since I think 2015, so hopefully you're still on the list. Um, you also received a Chevalier de l'Ordre National, the Merite, which is an, an important order for, from the French ambassador in Ireland, I understand. Um, and you're also, uh, for your jobs, you're also for the FM Leader of the Year Award in 2018 and the WXN 25 Most Powerful Women in Ireland. So it's, you know, you're, you're like, Oh my God, you know, role model. Um, and that was kind of a lead, uh, way of leading into, um, you know, my question that I would like to ask is, um, clearly you are out um, and you're in a position that's quite a senior position. So um, why you, do you personally, personally think it's important to be out uh, at, at that level? Because I, there are also lots of leaders who choose not to be maybe yeah. as, as vocal, as visible. Um, I'm very happy that you are, of course. And I'm kind of curious to uh, um, why you think it's important to talk uh, about about being out, but also um, if and why you think talking about lesbians is important. Okay, well, there's there's quite a lot in that in that question. Yeah, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's 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 very dear to my heart because if I go right back to when I was a young woman. Um, there were no visible role models of lesbians in Ireland. And if anything, and, you know, yes, there were a few internationally, probably people like Billie Jean King, Martina. So sport, I was quite into tennis, uh, as you might imagine. Um, but not, not, a, not a whole pile and not a lot in business and, and, and society. So I think my first sort of strong point for all of this is that it's incredibly important because I didn't have it and I can imagine what it would be like if I had 
it would have helped me, I think, a lot sooner in my journey. Because one of the difficulties in our community and in our world is that we hear so many negatives and it's really important to show people that you can have a really good life, um, you can progress, you can go forward and it doesn't have to be a bad thing if you come out. So that for me is probably one of the most important things. Um, I think to live in a community, in a neighbourhood, to have a sense of involvement in everything we do and to feel that your life is in this world it's hard to say normal at the moment but as normal as can be and that we just get through this you know i put out my bins i go to the i go to the the shops you know just that we're all part of a community and live very very actively yesterday um was my birthday which was lovely and oh, congratulations in, <laughs> thank you uh but it was it was really nice our neighbors in the, in the area we live here who are heterosexual very standard people came and you know celebrated with us and that feeling of community just feels so important so that's probably the first thing I think that um in business and in workplace we need to see more um more 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 role models and particularly in the lesbian side of things and that's probably coming back to that I think you know gay as a word has been and I've no problem with it Sometimes I call myself gay, sometimes lesbian, whatever. Um, but, you know, gay has been sometimes very sort of, um, very orientated around males um, and the, the L gets lost and, and, and the female gets lost. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, for those who are cisgendered, they may not they may not think about that all the time, but it's important to think about the female part of things and our needs are one from the community and what we need going forward and our lives are somewhat different and it's important to make sure that they're part of the conversation. So that's probably my second uh, big um, incentivization is to make sure that as part of the community we're represented and I think even more so now as we go forward because there are cohorts of us who are aging they're young we're you know we're all generations with every intersectionality happening to us and it's really important we have a voice in that as well do you think it's different um over the generations uh for, do you feel and this is looking at the island situation because i can tell from the netherlands situation mm. and i think it's different per country but from an irish uh, situation do you think it's different for for young women um to be out and um, and how activists is or how out they actually are or whether they, they just see it as part of well, normal life, I don't talk about it. Do, do you see any trends in that? Well, what I've noticed and I see it in our company, I see it in organizations, things I'm involved in, um, that I see a lot of young women come out in college. Um, they feel more comfortable. Like It's amazing the amount of my friends' daughters who my friends will say, so-and-so's, I think she's having a relationship with a woman. And I say, great, and try to be you know, encouraging and supportive. I see with my nieces and their friends, etc. But then the part that kind of concerns me a little is when they go into workplace, that they quite often often revert back to being in the closet or don't talk about it. For those who are bi, I think that's a challenge as well because it's a much more difficult story. And for trans women as well, these are these are journeys that take time to emerge. So I think generationally it's probably better than it was with I'm I'm 53 now as of yesterday. Um, but um I think for my generation it was much harder. Um, but I don't underestimate how hard it is and the fact that people are still reverting to not being open about their lives would tell me that we still have a way to go on that. And maybe the last point I'd make is I think if young women have children or are thinking of having children, then there's, there's, there's more layered complexity in that as well. Yeah. Okay. You mentioned uh, uh, going into, uh, when you get back into the office or when you get into the office, it becomes more difficult. Um, I can imagine from a, from a personal standpoint, it's always a choice. Um, what do you think the companies itself should be doing um, to make um, well, LGBT people in general, but specifically lesbians, feel more uh, comfortable so they can choose to be out if, that's their, uh, if they're ready for it? I think there's a couple of things, Marion. I mean, firstly, I think just like every other area of inclusion, diversity, it's important that the organization set, not only says the right things, but does the right things. And in everything we do, that we are, you know, whether it's a communication or whatever, that we're very inclusive. So we think about 
what does that mean for all these different strands of, of inclusion? Then the leaders, I think, need to be at any time when they're talking. And, you know, particularly at the moment, I've got our CEO and people coming on our Ida Hobbit today. You know, I've been really clear with them that they need to, they need to be very uh, vocal about everybody. Um, and then I suppose maybe the last part of that is that when we think about the intersectionality of our lives, so if we're talking about groups, say for parents, that we, we remember the L or the, the gay man and that, that we, we think about, you know, if we're talking about aging or if we're thinking about, you know, cultures or race or whatever that might be, that we think that it also intersections with people who are LGBT plus. So mm -hmm. it's the constant, making it part of our daily lives. And if I give maybe a last reflection as a workplace one, as we now re-enter back into the physical workplace, many of us. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm, I'm, I'm particular about this because probably like lots of us, I haven't stopped working for the last two months only. I've just been working in a different place. Um, and I'm a home worker most of the time. But as we go back into our buildings and our offices over the, over the weeks or some companies have, it's important to remember that in the conversation and are we inclusive as we bring people back as well and those yeah. conversations need to think about that okay so, so are there specific like programs that you would do for for the women or for, for our lesbians or um so how are there um concrete examples because of course you need to talk about it uh, as leadership um which is always important if nobody talks about it then it doesn't exist but are there also um spe specific activities or or plans that you do yeah, so in our organization, what we do is we, again, I kind of try to, uh, with the groups, look at it from, again, I go back to that intersectionality. So if we're talking, for instance, about generations, we try to, in the generations, make sure that we talk about LGBT plus and look at the individual needs of that community. So lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, mm -hmm. um, and intersex, and we, we try to bring those into the, into the conversation. The same with families. And again, I would be very uh, cognizant of making sure when I talk with my colleagues about families that there are, you know, there are gay families, LGBT plus families, and that, you know, same love, et cetera, but, but different family makeup. Mm. And I think particularly when we talk about lesbians, you know, the focus is to try and make sure that we talk about lesbian health needs, that we have particular programs. So through our, e our employee resource group, uh, we have a global pride one then with that group we try to maybe have a couple of times a year something that focuses specifically on the l or the bisexual woman or someone who's a trans woman or talk about intersex um, and again fashion a different conversation there so just like the same as for our male counterparts that each has its own lens of reflection we're collectively one group, but we're very different and making sure that there's a, there's a talk about that. And then I suppose maybe the last point I'd make is that by the very visibility of people like me, you, what we all do, we're having that discussion at the water cooler. I'm talking mm. about things that are happening for me. And, and so are my, my lesbian colleagues as well. So it's a mix of all of that and trying to also be careful that we, we keep it balanced and nobody mm. feels disengaged. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's good to hear. Um, I was also wondering, um, today's topic, of course, is uh, it's a double L, the, the lesbian part, but also the leadership uh, uh, part. Um, so if you talk about leadership, what is your vision on leadership? Is that the one person at the top of the pyramid or how, um, how do you def define leadership? Yeah. Um, then specifically also, you know, from a lesbian context, since that's the, the frame for today. Yeah, so I mean, for me, I suppose leadership has many different connotations. Um, when I talk with organizations who are coming new to, to LGBT+, plus, for instance, I always say that you need to have leadership at the very top that absolutely leads, stands, walks the talk, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm, if I'm truthful as, as, as we are and as many organizations on, on this group are, um, if we're mature in this space, then leadership is many faceted. It's not just your CEO or your head of people. It's all your managers. It's people across the board. I think allyship kind of married with leadership are, are probably the perfect mix. So you can get enough people to feel that they're allies across every divide of, of inclusion, then I think they as leaders naturally 
think about that when they're thinking about things. So again, going back to the re-entry into work. So some of my colleagues who were designing some of the, the, the technical aspects also thought, oh, what does that mean for disability? Mm-hmm. Some said to me, what does it mean for the LGBT? You know, so as leaders, they have that thinking on in their heads. Um, and I think maybe the last part that I think that leadership shows itself is when we have hard times and hard discussions, that that leadership comes forward, stands up and is vocal and is visible. Um, and so, you know, when I see that at whatever level, that's leadership for me. Yeah. You uh, you just mentioned hard times, and of course, you know we're in the middle of COVID. Um, or, or um, I was I was wondering, um, you know, there's many people in isolation now, also women. Um, and um, do, do you think that um, COVID affects women differently, um, and maybe also, uh, and I don't know if it's women in general or lesbian women, if it's different, um, and if you, do you see that at your your workplace, for example? Yeah, I see it in my workplace and in many, many workplaces. And yes, I do think it affects women differently. I think, first of all, it affects our community differently because more of our community, and this is a fact, um, I don't have the data in front of me, but it is a fact, is that more of our community work in the hospitality sector. So if more of the hospitality sector at the moment across the world is on furlough or have lost their jobs, more of our community, dare I say it, smoke and drink alcohol. That's just a fact as well. The, 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 the stats and my, 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 my partner works in health and, and the data will tell you that, um, you know, people who work in our, in, in hospitality have more predispondence toward, uh, health issues, particularly around respiratory illnesses, etc. So you combine a lot of those factors and they automatically, I think, create a, a perfect storm for this. Then I think for women, you know, and again, I acknowledge totally everything that's done by males. So I'm not knocking or anything, but, uh, I would suggest that women who are mothers, who are carers, um, and who in the family home, and no matter what your orientation is, if you are caring for children and elders and trying to do a job, then I think, uh, and a big amount of that responsibility, particularly over COVID, has come down on women. And for lesbians, maybe sometimes they're not always in a position where they're out at work. So they're like you and me today. They're trying to be on a call. Someone opens the door and it's maybe your kid coming into the room because I've seen this happen with people and they sh- they go, oh, go away or they're they're wanting their partner. You know, I've seen, I've heard people say they're texting and get the kid out of the room, which is terrible. Um, but you know, if people aren't open about their lives, then, and they're trying to take that burden, I think that's very difficult. Um, and then for women's health, your, your immune health, um, and in so many cases, particularly, um, for those who have, um, you know, lower socioeconomic challenges, I think it is very definitely hit. And in parts of the world, we see our communities where women who haven't had the health, same health benefits are suffering adversely. And particularly, again, another point to bring in and the intersectionality of this is around minorities and race. So more people, again, the facts will tell us, more people from a, what's sometimes titled, uh, you know, an African, Middle Eastern, Asian background, African-Americans have suffered adversely in this and women. So you put all that together, that's a, that's a big bunch of people. Yeah. Um, there's, there's a, the, I'm just trying to rethink how I, how, <laughs> that's okay. I, I have different things in the same time now. So I'm just thinking where to start. Um, with this new, this whole new normal now, um, we can look at it, uh, at women being, uh, hit harder. Um, and that of course is, is a sad thing with this whole new normal and the new situations in the way of the, what the technology has brought us, the insights that, uh, COVID has brought us on, there's quite a l- large number of women in those vital jobs. Um, do you think we, uh, there's are opportunities to, um, well, to leverage the knowledge to, to make the world better? Yeah, I mean, I think there's amazing opportunities. Um, was asked a similar question, uh, by one of our own teams this morning is doing something in Asia. And I mean, the biggest opportunity is around flexibility. So, you know, many organizations have, dare I say it flirted with flexibility over the over the last years Mm -hmm. um has it truly embedded itself I think it can be up and down we've seen that through COVID you know in one 
swift swoop. Everybody had to be working remotely. Um, I think flexible working is one of the most empowering things if you can make it happen. I've been very lucky in the organization to have huge flexibility in my working life for years. So true things like my both my parents being in ill health and, and dying and many, many things happening in my life. I've been able to manage to work around all of that. So I think as we go forward for women and men and for our community, I think it will be, you know, the more we can be focused on outcomes in workplace, not where you do it, lack of presenteeism will be a real, real positive thing. Hopefully as well that through all of this, we've seen more humanity in people. Mm. I mean, there's lots of bad stories and I agree with you. But there's also some been some fantastic things. So all the Zoom calls we've been on, all the, you know, and when you do see someone's kids or parent or partner in the in the background, you know, it makes me smile. And, and I love the humanity of that. And when I've seen my leaders, you know, Denny, who's our, our CEO, or Kathy, who's our Chief Human Resources Director, and when I see them and one of their family in the room and they're dressed maybe more casually and you see their living room, you know, I think that's a fantastic thing as well. So, you know, the more we kind of move away from that corporate has to be a certain way and boxes, I may be pretty, I'm pretty anti boxing people in. And uh, I like the fact that we've kind of broke free a bit on that. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, that's good. I recognize a lot of the things about the, um, um, also the zoom calls. Um, Cause I have actually been on, on zoom calls with um, the European Euro Asian lesbian community uh, with, Women from all over Europe, including um, Eastern Europe, Moscow, uh, Romania, also in France, and they were all in lockdown. It was really interesting how we can actually use modern technology um, to talk to each other. And they now have, uh, I think, weekly series to make sure that that's called le lesbian listening, I believe, uh, where people can just talk. And sometimes it is the I'm in complete isolation and I want to talk to someone. Uh, so modern technology has brought us great uh, solutions. Same as today, um, we're talking to you, and I think it would have been a lot harder to get you on a, on a well any sort of session in the Netherlands just for for an hour and, and to talk. So um, it's great that we can talk this way. Um, I'm also looking at the time. Oh, we have always oh, do have some time, and I'm sure that uh, the guys will uh, Mike will tell us if there's questions from the audience. But um, let me ask you one, one more question. Um, we already talked talk about, you know, what our company is doing and what is your company doing. And you touched on a number of things that, and also, um, you know, the ch t times are changing. Um, I was kind of wondering um, if we can take a little bit more of a deep dive into the key issues into the future for the LGBT uh, communities and, and, you know, workplaces and societies. Are there mm -hmm. doing things in a certain way, of course, over uh, many years and we have lots of successes? Um and I think with Workplace Pride, with using the, using the benchmark, for example, we, we learn a lot from companies, but times are quite different right now. So um, you're, you're going through some challenges, I think, with probably also with your company. Where do you see, um, maybe on a personal level or as a, on a company level, the, where we should focus uh, in, in the coming period? Okay, I think it's a great question, and thank you. Um, I think there's there's definitely personal and, and, and work. Um, maybe if I think about personal first and personal to us all but you know I think my one of my big big concerns you know reading the news this morning for instance I read about Hungary and they passed some legislation or they're in the process of passing legislation around um, taking back or um, refusing the rights of trans people. Um, I see in Eastern Europe um, you know, quite a strong opposition. I think Slovenia the weekend, I saw pictures and effigy of two gay men and a child being burnt in a public square. So I become really, really very worried that as nationalism and as sort of, a, I suppose, more right-wing movement swing up, then what it means is the rights of people like me and you and all of us are are eroded. So I think personally, I'm I'm think it's more important than ever that we step up and we speak up and we're we're fighting for what we have. I think we cannot take anything for granted. Um, I'm lucky, for instance, to live in a country where when we brought in a marriage equality, it was through a public referendum. So if the country, you know, if the leaders decide they don't want it in the morning, they have to go out to the public. But does that exist everywhere? How, how light a, uh, you know, how light a link is the legislation and the safety and the equality legislation? Um, I think about things like safety, safety from a point of view of travel. 
So we not only have COVID now and, you know, wear the mask and all the things, and that has its own challenges for people with disabilities and who, you know, might have a headdress or whatever it might be. But also I think about the safety. So when Sarah and I will travel, I'm always uber conscious about where we are, you know, I'm in the Netherlands, I feel very safe. Mm. You know, I would probably feel comfortable for the two of us to walk down the street and hold hands. But that's exceptional. That's pretty much one of the few countries I feel that. Whereas I go to other countries and even my mother-in-law who's 80, you know, warns and sends us messages and says, you two be really, really careful. Yeah. So I think those are the kind of things that personally I'm thinking about, you know, as I age, what's the what's what's the quality for people like us as we age because i look at and again i think the netherlands has great examples of what it does around elders and and the lgbt community but you know is that something i see universally um i had the experience to make it very sharp but my mum was in a nursing home for six years before she died she had parkinson's and i saw a transgendered woman in the nursing home who the staff treated really like she was a man and I had to challenge this a number of times, but lack of understanding of this. But, you know, so I, I worry about how do our lives go to the next stage? I worry for my younger counterparts. How do they, you know, how do their families happen? And if rights go away, what does it mean for the implications for kids and for families? So I suppose putting the workplace spin on it, I think the big concern I have is that through the pandemic, the COVID, and then the economic recession we're all facing is... What about the investment in, in diversity and inclusion? What happens to the money we will have spent in pride and all the things that have made us feel included? Um, I think it's going to be a harder fight. You know, so even the organizations that we're here today, you know, will every organization renew its fees and, and, you know, and it's more important than ever, but we need to make sure that that happens. So, and then for leaders in, and we go back to the leadership question is, you know, you can't just, d and is not a trophy. You don't take it down and dust it off every so often and say, this is really nice. You know, it's about the lived reality. So we need, um, we need leaders to stay very strong to that. And maybe the last part is to stay empathetic. I, I was writing something for a blog I'm doing and working just about empathy. You know, um, our, our community has been through a pandemic before. We're feeling it more at the moment. I think we know what it's like when people don't want to touch you and when they're, when they're afraid of you and they don't want to be in your presence. And particularly for those who were around in the eighties, um, around AIDS, et cetera, and HIV, we're probably more health wise susceptible to that. So, um, I think we want a lot of kindness and, and empathy and allyship at the moment. Yeah. I have so many extra questions in my head now, but I'm also, maybe, you know. Yeah, maybe just a reflection I would have, and it's, you know, please go ahead with the question, but just a quick one. But I was reading something recently that Diva magazine in the UK did a survey around lesbian lives, and it was quite interesting. I'm just looking at some of the points, but I just picked up a few highlights. But the space, you know, it's just something about, you know, even when we do events and we do things for lesbians, do we think and 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 the woman in 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 the female in all of our our lives? Do we think about are they really you know is there a balance? Are they because the the feedback was that they were very male spaces. Uh, the language we use is it inclusive enough? Um, you know the the fact that public spaces can be unsafe for women because there is no doubt that women feel an extra fear around being you know sexually harassed about um sexual abuse etc so i think these are things you know for us um and this is why the l again is really important that we bring this out mm -hmm. because it's unique and um, we need to just keep it in the conversation um i'm just seeing is there anything else about that but also being outed there seems to be a, a kind of a, a predominance of women being outed in the workplace and sometimes by other women Okay. So, and trans women will also speak to this, that sometimes when they haven't been, they're in the part, first part of their journey, somebody will say something to somebody in work when you're not ready. So, you know, I think these are all considerations and the implications can be quite difficult, particularly again, if one has children, you might have been ready for that to be out there. And maybe somebody's the parent of another child works in the company and it goes back and, you know, so the reverberations and safety, I think are something yeah. to to consider yes safe spaces is something i recognize a lot and it's it's an interesting thing um 
um, when you mentioned safety, I rem that reminded my, me of um, last year I went to the well the European Lesbian Conference in Kiev, um, and that made a huge impression on me because um, this wasn't just workplace, but this was mostly activists, and it was like 400 women in a room, all lesbians, very powerful um, activists and active uh, active um, activist people. Um, but the amount of talks about uh, violence and domestic violence or violence against women uh, and things like uh, being married out, um, uh, <laughs> so, so to make you straight again, and all of these things uh, was quite uh, amazing. Um, I remember even two women who were there on the, on the podium who uh, were from, I think, well, they were from somewhere in Eastern Europe. Let's, let's not name the country. Yeah. Um, they weren't allowed to be photographed and the names weren't even mentioned there because uh, if the word gets out, they just they can't go home because they, they would just be killed by their families, um, which is, a very, is, is maybe even stronger within women than uh, for gay men. So I find it really interesting to um, talk more, I think, uh, also in a wider community, not just among the women, uh, about specifically what, sa uh, what safe means for, for women. Um, and how that's different and how that maybe also means that we choose safe routes and therefore uh, we sort of self-censor ourselves from being visible because um, being visible also means, well, maybe less safe. Um, and that's an interesting thing. So I was thinking when you were saying all of these things, this isn't a question, it was more of an observation. Mm. <laughs> but I thought I just have to get that out. Um, yes, indeed. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, Mike. Wonderful. Uh, thanks to the uh, the chat. Uh, lots of good questions coming in, and I think still more coming in as we speak. Uh, just to start off, uh, Paul had a question at Margot, and it was specifically, how does your role model position work out globally in Sodexo? Um, I think it I think it works well, but you know the truth is that uh, different countries appreciate things in different ways. So in countries where you know being a lesbian woman is probably less appreciated, then I'm not, I never, I will never stop being who I am and I'm not going to deny that. But I'll give you an example. I was in uh, our, our APAC region before Christmas um, and uh, definitely, you know, I felt a little bit of, you know, it's probably, it's probably important to be a little, you know, people saying it's important to be a little less vocal here. So, um, you know, I was probably, Played down a little bit, maybe um, maybe some of my own personal flamboyance <laughs> around that, but I felt it was incredibly important for my colleagues and for those who aren't out and who might be but don't feel safe that I also, um, you know, was able to be honest and be transparent. So I I guess the answer, long and short, or summarizing is. I think it's incredibly important wherever I am in the world, but obviously I need to take into account the culture of the of the local place and, and adjust a little bit to that. Okay, thank you. Uh, right on to the next question, which is from Louise, and this is uh, to both Margot and Marion. Uh, she says, as mentioned earlier, you're out while you're in a very senior position at this point in your life. Uh, weren't you scared uh, regarding your orientation that it would be the most defining trait about you in the workplace, maybe back in the past uh, for example, oh, hey, that's so-and-so, they're gay, rather than, oh, hey, it's so-and-so, they're just killing it at their job. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I'll go first, Mary. <laughs> um, but yeah. Good, good one. I, I absolutely had that experience. I remember sort of somebody telling me many, many years ago, before I even came out of work, that so-and-so had spoke about me and said, oh, yeah, I'm Margo and she's a lesbian. I was going, oh, God, so that's what I'm going to be now. I wasn't a manager. I wasn't anything else. Um, and sure, and, you know, sometimes even in this work around diversity and inclusion, I'm very conscious that I'm representing all the different things we do in inclusion, not just LGBT+. plus. But on the other hand, I can't deny who I am, and it helps make me more empathetic. So um, I suppose it's about knowing how to how to play it and, and finding my balance. That's That's my way. Um, well, for me, it's it's uh, it's a very recognizable question. I think it's also a question that we get as women. Also, is like, well, are you are you just good at your job, or is this because you're a woman? Um, but I've learned to embrace that. And actually, um, I know I look quite um, well. You, you, usually, I'm in a in a very male dominated environment, so I'm usually one of the few women I, there, anyways. And with my hair and glasses, and the fact that I'm a lesbian, it, it just is a guarantee they remember me. Uh, so actually, that's become uh, help, quite helpful in 
um, in, in positioning myself and, and especially since I've become an entrepreneur or independent professional about 10 years ago, um, it's important that people remember me. Uh, and, and hopefully it's not just because they think I'm a lesbian with gray hair and big glasses. Um, but usually I do also talk, when I talk to people, I talk about content. So it's a nice anchor for them to remember this thing about particular things in my case about chatbots or when I talk about diversity or, um, data bias and all of these things. Um, whenever they, they see my picture or uh, they think of my content or when they think of my content, they'll think of me. So it's actually been quite helpful to, be out but I must say um, when back in 2003 um, David asked me um, to be uh, when we started the, the LGBT network at ING this is when I was quite still junior there he said uh, I also need a woman do you want to be that woman I'm like oh yeah I'll be the uber dyke of ING that'd be great um, what's I going to do for my career but the good thing is actually uh, it's it's brought me so much I've been to so many places I would normally not go it's given me access to people I would normally not have access to. And it's just really um, opened up my life in a good way. And um, I know I'm fortunate that I got that opportunity. I seized it and it's helped me further, but it also means I feel responsible um, to take some of that um, on to me to, to fight the fight for people who don't feel comfortable yet or who are not in that position. And so they don't have to. So I can take um, fight some of their battles by being visible. Um, and I'm actually quite happy being visible. So... <laughs> long answer to uh to that question but um yeah i'm i'm, I'm happy with um, being the lesbian uh next is nancy asking how can heterosexual women ally better in the workplace with lgbti female colleagues um i'll, I'll start and if marion wants to add anything um i think they can they can actually really do a lot for us because we have exactly the same you know issues around health family every every you know the, just because i've i've got that l sign doesn't mean I'm, I'm i'm any different in any way so you know even at 50 53 just like my my sister-in-laws i'm going through the menopause all of these sorry for mentioning these things on, on a webinar but you know for women's webinar yeah, right we exactly exactly but, uh, yeah and I'm, I'm 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 totally comfortable but uh you know it's interesting the more we my heterosexual colleagues include and say to me, well, what's that like from a lesbian perspective? I might be able to say, well, you know, it's a bit, I mean, the funny, my, my funny menopause story is, you know, so we're two women in a relationship, we're married and sleep in the one bed. Um, and, you know, at night with overheating, it's a nightmare because there isn't just one, there's two. And, you know, it's a great laugh with my heterosexual colleagues because they say, well, you know, my husband, uh, he sleeps through it all. And I say, well, no, the two of us are wide awake. So it's double trouble. Um, it's, I think it's important. It, it balances and flavors every conversation. Yeah. Um, one thing I, I mean, one thing I wanted to add to, to this one is I've noticed when we go to events, uh, diversity events, um, it's usually quite easy to understand who the male um, allies are because uh, they're usually quite vocal that they're not gay uh, in a good way, <laughs> or they're just known for you know because of their position. For the women at the event, it's usually quite hard to understand whether they're a straight ally or whether they're part of the community. Um, and from a visibility point of view, it, I find it quite helpful if we are both uh, all groups are outspoken. So also the straight women are are being clear about that they're straight allies. Um, so uh, when we st start talking about com things, we, we um, I don't actually assume that the woman who comes there um, is, a, is a, a lesbian um, because, well, she happens to be straight. So that's an interesting one. And usually now I ask, are you an ally? That's usually a giveaway. Um, but it's, it's a good conversation to have. Um, and I think we're, we're all women and we're all people. So we, we have a lot in common. Wonderful. Okay, quickly on to another question, this time from Catherine. Uh, what advice for lesbians who have been made re recently unemployed due to the pandemic and their subsequent search for employment? Uh, is there any lesbian professional networks that you can recommend to connect with? I, I'm, I'm aware of a few. Um, I don't know, you know, from a point of view of the Netherlands, um, if they're the correct geographical groups, but there's a, there's an enormously good organization called My G Work, which is based in the UK, which advertises some fantastic roles. Um, and it's worth 
channel, uh, Googling it and, and connecting with it. Um, it's not specifically lesbian, but I find it to be quite lesbian friendly. And one of the key um, people who, who directs it is a woman called Chloe, who um, I think always has the L in the, in the, in the content. Um, also, there's uh, LBQT women, uh, which I've recently made a connection with Marion with as well, who are working across now many, many countries. And again, they've got a network and of people who are really looking out and trying to help each other. So they're just two that come to mind. Marion, you might know some more who are relevant to the geography. Um, well, what I've noticed, talking from the Netherlands point of view, the the, the, the lesbian networks is not so much about career uh, helping each other, but it's a different way. We, we of course, have women at Workplace Pride, so mm -hmm. we're a good group of women. We do actually have a WhatsApp group with my ambition to have at least one um, woman from every company uh, in the group. We're not entirely there yet, and we are on social media. Um, but I've noticed myself is that... Uh, if, if I look for job opportunities, I tend to look more for within um, the the, the um, skill set area. So networks around AI or networks around you know, my profession. Mm -hmm. um, um, but then you, the question kind of comes up, and I think that might be the question behind this question is, um, can I be out uh, when I decide to apply for a job or should I go back into the closet? Because um, I don't want that to be um, um, hindering my job hunt right now. Yeah, I was just going to comment on another organization. I think you're absolutely right, Marion. Another organization who are doing some really interesting things and who advertise roles as well. Now it's very much in the tech space. They're called Lesbians Who Tech. Um, and uh, again, Google find them and, and they've got a platform where you can either advertise roles or look for roles. So I think a few of those. G Work definitely um, seems to be really expanding globally as well. So and if I find any more, I'll certainly share with you, Marion, and the, and, yeah. and the group. Okay, wonderful. Uh, next question is from Graham. Uh, he says, we see, some, we see some evidence of a rise of homophobia as a result of COVID. And to pick up to your point earlier, he says, this may disproportionately impact lesbian women. Uh, what can companies committed to LGBTI inclusion do to counter this concerning trend? Um, okay, so uh, I mean, probably retracing some of the things I've spoken to, but I think they need to um, just raise the flag and be incredibly, you know, they need to come out stronger than they probably did before. This is the kind of whole thing about, you know, you either lead from the front or the back. This isn't the time for the back. This is the time for the front. They need to uh, reinforce the commitments that they've actually got. They need to reinforce the commitments to standing by people. I think this is a time where, again, going to allyship will be incredibly, um, will incredibly make a big difference, I think, for people. So maybe it's it's great to think about how do you do something that vocally shows allies. Um, we did a thing in Sodexo some years ago, and I know it meant a huge amount to me. And we had thousands of people who did it. They literally recorded a you know two second video, and it was like, "Hi, I'm John. I'm an ally, or I'm an LGBT ally, or whatever." But they were all collected and collated, and you could go on our intranet and, and look at them, and wow, was it powerful. So I think, you know, it's leadership, it's commitment to financial investment, because we need to we need to hunker down on that and make sure that that's there. And then I think, you know, every organization has a challenge, um, as leaders do, around who do they do business with, countries they do business with. Um challenge about maybe who their supplier chain is. So all the things that kind of create the different strands of the story that may be negative um, and stand by your convictions. And if there's an opportunity and it's with a company who is very anti um, our community, then I would expect my organization stands up for what it believes in and around that. Okay, wonderful. Uh, Angelique uh, asks, what is the focus on inclusion from the board itself? Uh, specifically when Margot mentioned the economic recession. I think this is leading into what you've already said, but if you can talk to that. So, I mean, I would say putting my Sodexo hat on, I'm coming um, from an organization that is incredibly uh, connected with this. So our chair is a lady called Sophie Bellon. She's the only lady who is a chair of, a uh, female chair of a CAC top 40 in, in, in France. She is exceptionally, and it's literally been there from her father, who was our founder, um, very committed to inclusion. 
and they have you know they see themselves as and the and the board sees Sodexo as a as a social engine for improvement etc and quality of life at the, at the core so i'm not having to speak to the unconvinced and in actual fact they ask that question about lots of things we do they say but what's the inclusion angle of that or how do we how do we make sure so in my case and in Sodexo's case that's a that's a that's a very positive for those who are not i think it's really important to make sure the business case is really real and for us as activists and those who are in these roles that we can make sure that we are having that conversation and that we help our leaders to understand why it's important now because you know i had a i had a chat with our ceo the other morning and i literally sent him a list of all the things that are coming up on covid for our you know around dni and he kind of went okay you know he's he's got stuff coming at him left right and center i have to help him to to make those decisions and understand as well all right quickly on to maybe one or two more questions uh, graham asks uh, any advice for those that choose not to be out and keep a strict debarkation between home and work and yet he says the current work situation and technology means that work inevitably intrudes into the home so any advice on that my view is you know if you if you don't wish to be out then you don't and i'm i'm hugely respectful of that i had a period of time in my own life when i didn't wish to be so um i would never you know want to to push that with anybody i think though it's 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 so important to make sure that we keep reassuring people that it's okay to be out and as marian just said i think a little while back it's been the one of the best things that happened to her it's been one of the best things that happened to me you couldn't put me back in the closet now because i wouldn't know how and i wouldn't want to go back so we need to keep showing that it's a good thing but everyone's got to find their own way now yeah it's tricky um, i think um if i hear someone saying i would uh, want to stay in the closet uh, it, it is their their own rights um i'd be um un um curious to what the rationale behind that is what the fear is and see if i can somehow help address it um because that's something I, i do want to take away from all of these things is you know is there something i can do for the community to make it a little bit easier and is this just uh is this some insecurity or is there a real issue going on so i think for those who are um wanting to stay in the closet for for all the right reasons i think it is important to see if you can find um well a, a, a covid buddy so someone to speak to to at least um see how you can work around it or in fact maybe there is someone in, uh, in your company in the network or someone who works in your company or or somewhere else that can help you so you can actually see how can i um work around these issues because usually there's an issue behind it so um not wanting to be out means either um it's there are legal issues in the country which um it, yeah that's a fair that's a fair enough point to not want to be out because it, you know prosecution is an issue if it's about you're not feeling safe within your company i think it's an, an important signal that somehow to get that into the company's network uh, so they can start helping address that and someone else who can be out who's comfortable uh, to be out can then speak on your on your behalf uh, about these issues and see if we can and create some security um and otherwise yeah teaching people how to hide themselves uh, is something i'd a bit reluctant to do but um and uh, i think they 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 can find their own way to be uh, careful i i know i've learned to talk around things from time to time so you, you don't mention your partner or um you talk around things and you start to be in a bit bit more general terms but it doesn't help i've learned if you start to hide things people know um so it's trying to i think so like i said trying to find that find a way to help solve the issues that cause you to be in the closet would be uh the only advice i really want to give Okay, thank you so much. Uh one quick question if we can answer it briefly then I think everybody can finish on the dot at one. Um Nicolette asks or says I have learned from uh, Javier who's an accent uh, Accenture person that one of the key strategies in fostering female leadership is to have strong allies men and women. Uh can you give some more examples of how you've worked on that both of you perhaps? Yeah, um I think um I'm trying to sort of remember the core of the question but I think strong allyship both men and women is incredibly important. I I think these days we need to expand it to make sure, you know, particularly if we're if we're looking around um difference to make sure that we also include, you know, that those women of color that they, that we we pick up some of the intersectionality like our our trans community as well. those are bisexual intersex that we have a little bit of um making sure that we we balance everything um and so that um the conversations 
have an influence of people who have different spectrums and life experience. But I guess going back to mentorship, um, I think mentorship is always about a, a relationship that two people form. And uh, the most important thing is that they form a, a relationship and, and support each other hugely. And that, that allyship is is really evident and it's not just short term. It, you know, the thing I think about allyship, uh, sorry, around mentorship and sponsorship is sponsorship goes on and is wider and is bigger. So if you can get to sponsorship, that's probably the, the best scenario um, for anything because the person never stops trying to promote you and talk about you and help and support you. Well, Marco, thank you very much for having this uh, candid conversation. And it does feel like I'm kind of sitting in your living room having a nice chat while the world is watching. Um, and I want to, so thank you very much for giving us the opportunity. And uh, I hope we, uh, we get more opportunities to chat this way or in other places. Um, over to David, because I think you have some, um, there was a question about uh, some logistics also in the, in the questions I saw. So David has all the answers in that front. David, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Mary. I, I hope I do have all the answers. But let me first of all thank, uh, really from my heart, Margot and Marion for uh, taking part in this webinar. It's been both insightful for me, even after doing this for so long. And what I liked so much was a very hopeful message. And that's really how we can best help our community all over the world, which is, which is really fantastic. I'm happy to see, actually, that we had uh, people calling in from 10 different countries so this is another way for us to help spread our message uh, around the world about LGBTI workplace inclusion. So uh, thank you to both of you very much again for that. So yes, as we close down, uh, the next webinar in the Workplace Pride series is going to be hosted by Tech at Workplace Pride. So they're very focused on technical issues for the LGBT community. And it's a very fascinating title. The theme is going to be, there's always a rainbow in the cloud. The cloud think about it the technical cloud as well so that webinar will be on wednesday the 27th of may uh, at one o'clock central european time so i encourage everybody to try to uh, attend that uh information will be on the workplace pride website uh, and we will also send around invitations so these are open to anyone so feel free to invite your colleagues and uh, friends uh, if they want to know anything about lgbti and the rainbow in the cloud so thank you very much to everybody again and see you next week. Thanks, Marion. Thanks, David. Bye -bye. Appreciate it. Bye, everybody. Bye -bye.